Well, welcome, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? Good? Good? Or did night this evening? Yeah, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, we're, so I think we'll, oh, a few more people are coming in, so we'll just wait a, a moment or two before we get started. But we're really grateful to see you all, all here today. Um, and we're also grateful to uh, CCTV Town Meeting Television for recording this. So um, we'll be able to share it with other people. And when you're so excited after hearing the presentations and joining the discussion, and you want to watch it again, you'll be able to. So are we, are we good on your end? Perfect. Great. So, hi. I'm Jess Hyman with the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, CVOEO, and it is my pleasure to be here today with all of you and with our wonderful speakers, Corinne Yantz from CVOEO and Sarah Russell from CEDO and others to celebrate Fair Housing Month. And as many of you may know, Fair Housing Month ce uh, celebrates the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which enshrined really essential protections into federal law to make sure that everyone could have equal access to housing choice and the opportunity to rent, buy, finance, and live in their homes free from discrimination or harassment. Um, this country has a long history of separating people based on who they are, what they look like, like the color of their skin, where they're from, their religion, uh, who they love. The Fair Housing Act is intended to protect against discrimination in housing based on those characteristics and also go even further than that. So the Fair Housing Act didn't just uh, make it illegal to uh, treat people unfairly at, in their homes, but it also requires us all, it requires gover governments at a federal level, state level, local level, and really all of us to do more than just not discriminate, but to take active steps to correct and repair the harm done by um, centuries of discrimination and segregation in this country. Um, so when we talk about Fair Housing Month, this is an opportunity to raise awareness about the important protections that exist under federal and state law. Um, and it's also an opportunity to pledge to do better and to make changes in our community to make sure that everyone is welcome, everyone belongs, and everyone can have a safe and affordable place to call home. Um, so as we're Promoting Fair Housing Month, I got a really good phone call a week or so ago from someone who said, hey, how can you celebrate fair housing? There are so many people who are struggling. There are so many people who don't have access to that basic human right that is a home. And she said, she said how could you possibly even talk about celebrating? What we, and well, I'll say what, what, I, what I had said to her, that the reason that we celebrate is because we want to celebrate what's working. We want to celebrate what happens when communities are diverse, when they're inclusive, when everybody does have a home. And we, want, we also want to talk about all these issues in a positive way, because we can't make cha systemic change in our world, uh, in, our, in our world, in our state, in our community here in Burlington. We can't make change without um, talking about it, without getting people at all, all, all over the political spectrum, um, all over the age range and background, et cetera, involved in the conversation. Because as we talk about these important things and why it's so important, why home is so important, why where we live makes such a difference, then we can start making change. So here we are, Fair Housing Month. Um, before I turn it over to Corinne, I need to thank the folks who have are made this, these events possible because the Fair, the Fair Housing Month events cover the whole state, there, there's been, there have been weeks of art activities, films, art exhibits, community discussions, and, and other events put on by a lot of different people and organizations. And I just want to take a moment to thank them because this is being recorded and we want to make sure that everyone um, gets the, the, the kudos that, that they deserve. Um, so the key partners for Fair Housing Month activities are Burlington City Arts, Junction Arts and Media, ONE Art Center, 
Randolph Community Development Corporation, Rural Edge, Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development, Vermont Department of Libraries, the Vermont Human Rights Commission, Vermont Legal Aid, Vital Communities, White River, the White River Consortium, and our partners right here in the building, CEDO. We are so grateful to the City of Burlington and CEDO for being a partner in the fair housing work and also for sponsoring the delicious food that we're eating tonight from Saigon Kitchen, which is along the back. Please help yourselves. There's lots to eat up. Um, and also the free books in the back corner of the room um, are all provided by CEDO. So please take a look at the books, sign one out, and then keep an eye on your email for a book discussion later, later this um, this spring or summer. Also on that table, we have art kits for the Heart and Home Art Project, which Corinne's going to be talking a lot more about in just a few moments. Please take them home, share them with your, with, your, with your family. They're good for kids, good for adults, and really a fun way to explore what home and community means. Uh, we have a number of very special sponsors who made this possible, Feral, Feral Properties, the Burlington's Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging, CEDO, of course, Redstone, Vermont State Housing Authority, Champlain Housing Trust, Evernorth, Main Street Landing, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, Cathedral Square, Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and Pomerlo Properties. And we are grateful for all of them, and especially grateful for all of you for being here tonight. So we're going to hear from, from, from Corinne Yance, who is my colleague, friend, an amazing community artist a housing advocate, and she's going to talk about home and community and art. And then we will he we'll hear from Sarah Russell from CEDO, uh, who, will, who will talk about uh, issues and, and related to, to homelessness. And then we're going to talk about what this all means and how we can, how talking about these issues, how thinking about our vocabulary of home can help us make a better place and make sure that everyone can have access to a safe and a stable uh, and accessible and affordable place to call home. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to Corinne. Hello. Um, and just so you know, I really appreciate people eating food while they're here. It makes me feel less nervous about being at a podium. So please take care of your needs while you're here. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot of talking today, as in I'm going to be doing a lot of talking, and then we're all going to talk together. Um, and so this presentation is kind of a unique setup. Um, for those who know me, know also that I am both a housing advocate working for the Fair Housing Project. We're part of the housing advocacy program of CVOEO, the Champlain Valley of Economic Opportunity. I'm also an artist, and what I'm trying to feel out in this um, city hall this evening is uh, my thesis for school. So I'm coming to an end of my graduate program. And wouldn't you know, I've been talking a lot about housing at my graduate art school. Uh, but I found some really uh, kind of funny overlaps. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And so um, basically, if I were to succinctly say what my overlaps are, it's really about the language that we're using when we're talking about housing. So I'm talking to you today about how we are talking about home. Um, and then for those of you in the room who are uh, in the housing field, you might be familiar with the question of, um, you know, when your family or friends are asking what you do for work and, and they can't quite remember what it is. They're like, well, are you still working at the housing authority or are you still working at the shelter? You know, they kind of group all the housing things into one familiar word. And it's kind of exhausting to like try and describe what it is that you're even, oh, I use pictures for this one. I gotta get to my slideshow. Yeah, so what is it that we're doing? Are we all standing outside with signs all the time? It's kind of exciting, that's, that's I wish that that was always what it looked like. But yeah, it's hard to talk about what we do. And then for those of you in the room who are artists, you might be equally dreading that question when someone asks, well, what do you do for work? And then you say, uh, I'm an artist, and you feel bad about it. And then you also know that whatever they're imagining an artist is, is definitely not what you're doing. 
This is me explaining what I do. Here I am also explaining what I do. So yeah, the way we talk about things are really hard. The names of things capture so little of what we're trying to communicate. And I kind of wonder if this is true for every profession. You know, I wonder if like the city planners are like so tired of explaining like what it's like to go to, I don't know, public hearings or the bureaucratic hoops that they're going through. I kind of don't even know like, you know, we all have assumptions about what this work looks like. Yep, here I am in both my different roles. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit. I, for, for me, I have to start at the beginning, like uh, to, to help show kind of what the overlap is for me. Um, and of course, home is kind of the beginning for everyone. Um, and I have a picture up here of my first home. Uh, on the left is a picture of my uh, women's small business program that I participated uh, through Mercy Connections uh, for free um, with a VSAC grant. Um, I wanna say like five years ago, but time is very stretchy right now, so that could be wrong. But I met um, Mary there, who's a good friend of mine to this day, and ended up helping me buy my first house. So on the right is uh, my family, or my friends, who are my family in a lot of ways, celebrating my 30th birthday at, um, for when we're moving into the house. Stable housing is really important. So, uh, I, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I feel like for me it's helpful to kind of uh, contextualize it in the personal. So stable housing for me gave access to reliable, safe health care and helped me diagnose um, an autoimmune disease that I now have a really reliable doctor to help treat. Um, it gave me critical uh, mental health services that I was able to share with my family when they moved in with me and at uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it also emp empowered me to overcome complex trauma that made it really hard to drive. So I actually um, just got my driver's license. I am 32. Uh, and I got my driver's license last fall with the help of Higher Ability. And again, this is a resource that I was able to access because I have a stable community, people that could help me connect to the services I needed. Um, I also want to note, too, I wonder if um, uh, I'll circle back to this. Um, I, stable housing uh, helped me build my chosen family, and my chosen family allows me to kind of take care of my own stuff and be more present for my family, who, it, you know, have a lot of things going on. Um, it's taught me to care about our role in civic engagement, which might sound funny to a lot of people who know me as a housing advocate. I really didn't care for politics at all uh, up until my mid-20s. I really felt like I disenfranchised by the system because I didn't know how I engaged with it. Um, let's see. Oh, and it's like giving me a place to rest, to really be myself. Feeling that sense of belonging, having a place that you have agency over, like it, it just, it's kind of indescribable unless you've like been in the position where you're constantly exposing yourself to people, where you don't have privacy, or a place where, you know, like right now I'm at a podium and I'm kind of performing for you all, but we're all kind of performing when we're in public spaces. And I just wanted to note too that um, accessing these really important resources, uh, like higher ability, meant identifying with uh, terminology that I actually didn't relate to, and this comes up a lot in my work. So, you know, when we receive public services, you kind of have to check a box, say you're a thing to get the thing, right? And so um, it was difficult for me to kind of overcome that challenge to say, I have a disability, I need to access this service, but it was really important for me to have agency in my life, to be able to move through the world, to have job um, abilities, or, you know, at, more jobs options. Um, and just on that note, um, a kind of anecdote, uh, my colleague and I were teaching a Vermont Tenants workshop. Um, it was a translated workshop, so we're teaching, we had a translator 
um, interpreting everything we said into Lingala. So surely, because we know words are so um, weirdly interpretive and dynamic, there's always information lost in that way. And one of our participants kind of like looked at us and said, hey, all right, listen, I worked really hard to get my housing. And a lot of the folks that we were working with were in precarious housing situations. So they were making decisions to just get their basic need met. That might mean um, overcrowding. There's people overcrowding. There is one uh, woman who couldn't get in and out of her apartment without help, which is extremely unsafe. And so this person says, hey, like I have to say I am homeless to get the services I need, and I'm not gonna say that. You know, I worked really hard to get this housing. And what we know as housing advocates is that homelessness, just as every other kind of like word I'm throwing out there, doesn't look a certain way. There's a lot of different um, ways that, um, you know, it, we, we're kind of like giving this narrative that's like the most like visible way to talk about it, but there's like folks that sleep in cars, there's folks that couch surf. It, again, there's this kind of definition that doesn't fit everyone. And in this moment, the um, at, telling someone like you have to say that you're homeless in order to get the thing that you need was a real a, a significant barrier for this community. All right, so the other thing I'll just say too is um, home is a deeply personal conversation. So for me, home is always, um, like the first place is always this house in Vermont that I lived at and with, and with my family. So we lived um, in Brownsville, Vermont. It's a little uh, village in West, Win West Windsor. Uh, they call it the Connecticut River Valley down there, but I really remember it for the Mill Brook. That's where we uh, released our, our salmon that we would raise at uh, Albert Bridge Elementary. Um, and that was a really important place for me. I, I, I arrived when I was in second grade, and at that time I had moved more, time, more years than I had lived. So it was like this place. And it, it, you know, it's the place that like comes up in my dreams all the time, and um, a really important spot. But it wasn't meant to last. Um, as families do, we went through some like really challenging stuff. My mom ended up raising us on her own. And basically, you know, like in that part of Vermont, like you're driving to get to school, you're driving to get to work. If you're a single parent and you're raising four kids, I'm like, is this a picture? Yeah, look at these kids, terrible, <laughs> right? So basically what that meant was that either the job wasn't attended to when it was supposed to be or the kids weren't. Someone got the short end of the stick. And it also meant that my mom's um, mental health got really challenging and we weren't meeting our basic needs anymore. And it, it led to a lot of like bad stuff. So, you know, we like weren't making it to school. We weren't like getting our food met, or, or we weren't getting food at night. And um, basically, eventually, we lost our house, which meant we lost our pets and our spaces and all the places we played. That's my mom. She kind of looks like me. Funny how that works. Yeah, it was a really vulnerable time. Um, and basically what I learned from my time of housing insecurity, which was a long time, is that um, most places aren't hospitable to outsiders. So it's kind of, um, when you're in a transient place, it's your most like public, uh, it's the most visible things that people know about you because you don't have a private place to have that. So, um, you know, my community knew about the fights I got with my mom at the gas station, you know, very um, visible things or when we were pulled over close to school. And people, you know, aren't all kind and generous and so there certainly were like neighbors and teachers and friends and um, parents' friends that said things about it. And 
And then meanwhile, the things that you do need slip through the cracks. So people are really remembering the things that you wish they wouldn't remember, but the things that uh, you wish people would notice are not visible. Um, and then the other thing too that I just um, wanted to draw attention to is that for a single woman, for a single mom, there's extra attention on certain things. So um, extra attention on how she conducted herself, um, what she did for work was always a topic of conversation, what she was wearing, who she was seeing, which, you know, wasn't always the same person. Uh, yeah, this is the things dropping through the cracks. I'm using some of my art, my like messy art, just to kind of illustrate some of these transient feelings. So the story you are told about yourself is one you start to live. And so as a young adult moving from one apartment to the next, I began to feel sorry for intruding on other people's neighborhoods. You know, like I felt bad when, especially when my neighbors were like homeowners, like, sorry, I'm one of them, like just passing through. Um, I was forced to sublet illegally in an overcrowded apartment for my first like few years of um, independent adulthood because I had bad credit and didn't have a family member to um, how, you know, co-sign for me. And that apartment was infested with squirrels and now is burned down on King Street. So there you go. Um, yeah, and I felt like a criminal in the place I slept because I, I wasn't supposed to be there. Um, by um, 16, I was crashing on friends' couches with parents that, like, you know, wouldn't notice, um, which said another kind of thing about the, how the, my friends were living. By 17, um, or by 17, it started to be um, buildings uh, on top of buildings, gazebos, churches. Whoop, where did my thing go? Yeah, and honestly, housing insecurity uh, exposed my three sisters and I to violence, lack of safety, and uh, persecution. So when I started working in affordable housing, I used to say uh, access to affordable housing would have changed my family's life. And it's a nice thing to say. In a lot of ways, I believe it's true. Um, and while I believe it could have, I will say it's not always true. And I know that it's, it's a hard thing to bring up in a space where we obviously need more affordable housing. Where am I? So basically what happens in affordable housing, especially in these more high density um, situations, is that you have um, you know, a little bit less privacy and, and your life is uh, more surveilled. So as I was saying with these moments of like the fights at the gas station, um, it's nice to have those fights where no one else hears them. We all have them. We have messy, family is a messy business. And if you are dealing with crisis or poverty or mental health issues, really common stuff for anyone, especially common, and uh, communities that are experiencing lots of trauma, uh, you don't want other people to be privy to that. And you certainly don't want to feel like um, it's a tr intruding on someone's space or that they might call the police on you. Um, in some cases, living in affordable housing can be um, really great. So um, if you have a great relationship with your neighbors, um, they might walk your dog for you. Um, let's see, I'm going to stay here for a second. Um, I, know a great, uh, I know a gentleman at Decker Towers that walks uh, dogs for all of his neighbors. He, uh, he's often bringing up uh, folks to the hospital. That's a big building, so he's a busy person. Um, I receive uh, calls from people in affordable housing all the time concerned about elderly neighbors that they, um, when they notice that they're not able to care for themselves anymore. Um, there's a woman at Laurentide who is always surrounded by a gaggle of kids that are not her own, but she's certainly entertaining them, just a great lady. Uh, and there's a, a man at Juniper House that if you just like l talk to him for like, you know, three minutes, he will always be bringing you food. Uh, these are all affordable housing communities, by the way, and they're all different. So, um, you know, some are Champlain Housing Trust, some are Cathedral Square, which is senior living. 
Um, and I know um, I spoke to an Arabic woman, uh, or an Arabic-speaking woman, um, at uh, Franklin Square Housing, that's a Burlington Housing Authority property. And she came to, she was one of the only people that came to our workshop, but she came with a list of concerns for her and her neighbors that she was getting clear answers on. And she brought them back to her community. But affordable housing is tasked with uh, holding a lot of complex and conflicting needs. And our solutions are often limited to just enforcing the rules. I was told by a resident recently he doesn't let his daughter have friends over because he's afraid he'll get a lease violation, which is against the Fair Housing Act. And that's part of why we do so much education for Fair Housing Month. I was told by a high school older sister that her um, siblings and her are afraid that their landlord's going to no cause evict them and that they're going to lose their uh, housing voucher. And she's worried that she's not going to make it through high school. Um, I remember when I first started working um, in affordable housing, I was an AmeriCorps member. I also worked at the grocery store because anyone who knows AmeriCorps knows that you can't live in Burlington with that stipend. Um, and my coworkers pretty consistently would ask, they'd be like, oh, you work in affordable housing? I live at, you know, Champlain Housing Trust, BHA, blah, blah, blah. And they'd, they'd bring this, like, their complex problems to me, like trying to tell me, like, hey, can you explain to my property manager that the, the smoke coming into my apartment is making my kids sick? And they're thinking, it's a language barrier, but my coworker's gonna help me out. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm gonna help you out. And then I'm trying to navigate the system, and that's when I realized, like, oh, this is really hard, and I'm not gonna get an answer for this coworker. Let's see. And thus brings us to the conflict of today. <laughs> So here we are this year, and I'm realizing um, in grad school, I'm in Baltimore doing the artist life, which feels like a pretty bougie way of living, giving the other work I do. And I'm showing uh, my mentor paintings like these, and I'm saying it's all about home, right? And I think it is still. But he goes, hey, I actually don't see any home here. Like, where's the roof? Where's the window? Where's the door? You know, like, I see relationships. I see relationships between people and spaces and objects. And I was pretty bummed because I was like, wow, my whole thesis just got sunk. Thank you. Um, but then it was funny because uh, I, you know, come back to Vermont and I'm teaching these tenant skills workshops. At the Fair Housing Project, we do a lot of our outreach through partnerships with um, different organizations. Um, and we had a partnership with the Vermont uh, Garden Network, which was great because um, I always find that people like talking about their housing issues when they're not coming to a conflict-oriented space. So. Uh, you know, if I come and do a workshop and it's like, like, know your rights, everyone's like, I'm good, thank you, I'm not getting into trouble, you know. But if I'm coming and I'm just like at a garden where everyone's like learning about planting garlic, um, and then I introduce myself like, hi, I'm Karen, I work for the Fair Housing Project, they're like, you know what's fair? I'll tell you what's fair. And then I'm over here like, okay, now I have to explain what fair housing is. The difference between the capital F fair, like the Fair Housing Act and housing discrimination, and just what's like, you know, feels not right in the world, which, you know, if you don't have housing choice, a lot of things can feel unfair. And it comes back to language, right? So I'm still having this thing where, like, at grad school, they're like, this isn't housing. In my workplace, they're like, I don't understand what you're talking about when you say fair housing. Um, and so the thing is that we talk about housing, and we all have this, like, weird icon that comes to mind, the, like, square with the triangle. Um, you know, you can start to see it here. There's a more happening with this image of a house than the icon. When I give this young person credit. Um, so, and we see this all the time at the Fair Housing Project. We uh, 
put out our heart and home art kits as Jess was talking about. They have free art supplies, but they also have these art prompts that ask people to kind of reflect on what home means to them. And we often get the square, the triangle. And I'll tell you, a lot of the people we work with don't live in what we call a single family home. That's what's being represented. That's the iconic single family home. We, we work with a lot of people that live in homes that um, you know, might look like a box with a lot of windows or might be a mobile home, you know, like, or a modular home as we're calling them now. The, you know, most people living in mobile homes still call them mobile homes, but it all comes back to language, like who you are, who's, who you're speaking to, right? And so then we had this kind of like amazing thing happen uh, last year. Uh, we had uh, a library, one of the things we do for Fair Housing Month is we partner with libraries and libraries get all our kits out in the community. And this librarian, um, Bent Northrop Library up in our, in our Northeast Kingdom, uh, partnered with um, a local school. And I'm showing you what, like six? We got like 50 of these submissions, so many. And so the librarian basically um, worked with the art teacher and kind of like asked the kids to take this one step further, this conversation about home. And look at what we got here. I mean, we have Avery's over here with these purple curtains and this, um, this unicorn window or poster, I don't know. Uh, Joe is showing the cat on the refrigerator, which anyone who's had a cat like just knows that feeling so much. And this really distinctive floor pattern. Uh, Riley's either got a um, secret friend, you know, imaginary friend, or a sibling and a bunk bed. Uh, uh, Myla, I, my eyes are kind of bad, so I can't, I think Myla is the name. Um, this is a spaceship. So good for Myla. Um, Lane is over here saying, like, my PS4 is the thing that makes home. And I'm just not just going to dry it. I'm also going to label it. Uh, so the PS4. And then the couch, of course. You can't have a PS4 and no couch. Um, and then look at this, like, purple flooring. So just to say that, what are these kids doing? They're showing us, our students, students, they're showing us relationships to their space, relationships to the people sharing their space, and relationships to the objects in that space. Um, oh, and I do like to end on um, Declan's piece because as we can see, it's a tent with the moon and the dogs. And um, I, I think that it really just shows us that we have assumptions about what people need and want in home, but like if they really are asked to think about it, it might not be what you think it is. And, you know, like Declan might like have a space that's like protected from the elements. But I think it's just kind of interesting to think about how Declan's really connected to this kind of rural space. And this is just from our Heart and Home kit. So yeah, when I think about home as a person that's moved a lot in my life, I think about the people and the places. So I, in that way, having connection to place is really important. Um, and, you know, like, what's the problem I'm presenting? I'm not asking everyone to become artists because I think that art is more nuanced when we talk about home. I do think that. But I am saying that there are different ways that we can be talking about home, thinking about home, and engaging the people that are being housed. And I actually think that that work is already being done. Um, and this is a mosaic that um, I did with Mary Lacey down at the water, the, the bike path. And I will say that we engaged um, that gentleman um, from Juniper Collective that, that will give you food. Uh, he came right over to this mosaic with food for us. Um, and so uh, I had the privilege this past uh, April of curating a set of Fair Housing Fridays. So these are virtual conversations that we're having with um, community leaders, uh, housing providers, uh, residents in affordable housing, um, people with stakes in housing, all kinds of people about different housing topics. Um, and so we had three big uh, topics that I curated, so I really like led us up to this moment here. And the first one was about resident agency and home space. 
Um, and so our, our friends uh, at Juniper Creative, Will and Jennifer, came and talked about how um, having, um, inviting residents to um, really change the space that they're living in and have a stake in that space and how we're representing figures in that space is important for a sense of community. So I just used some representations. These are just like drawings from different community projects. I do, the other thing I'll just say too while I'm on this is that um, I think at, when we're talking about affordable housing, it's also important not to like tokenize the people that we're serving and that can be hard because we also want to um, be inclusive, right? Um, but there's always that, that risk if we're relying too heavily on the image of the people that need the service that we're giving. Um, I also asked um, a resident that we worked with at Lauren Tide, that's a Champlain Housing Trust building, to um, speak to how doing uh, resident engaged projects uh, changed our sense of community. And um, I will say that since uh, my peer Lydia here and I led this art project, um, the resident leaders that kind of emerged from this project are still organizing in their community today, uh, including doing weekly uh, coffee sessions. Um, I'm sorry, Megan, for that like weird screenshot, <laughs> but I did want to talk about how Evernorth, um, uh, Megan from Evernorth was one of our um, speakers at this Fair Housing Friday and did a really excellent presentation about how they're engaging um, residents in the rehabilitation projects that they're leading. Um, and so I'm going to not do it justice. Fortunately, this is all recorded, so everyone can, can watch this conversation. But this was, um, Megan was talking about how we have assumptions about how people might use a space. And when they did some um, engagement with the residents, it made their work more efficient because they're also learning like, hey, actually, you know, um, the assumption was that people with two and three bedroom apartments like would have their own washer dryer unit in the building. And they learned through this survey that that was not the case at all. And there were some other like really interesting things that they learned through, I mean, Megan had like a 15 minute presentation. You should just check it out because it's up on our website. So we should listen to the people that we're housing. It seems like pretty basic, but I think the urgency of our work can sometimes make that step feel too hard. And I don't know if it is too hard. Um, home is more than a place. We really need to be talking about as, um, uh, well, I don't know if that, it's, home is more than uh, the brick and mortar. It's a place where people live. It's a space that people interact with. Um, we also heard from our friends in the Connecticut River Valley. There uh, was two um, young, really um, rad um, media makers, documentarians, and uh, tenant um, organizers that came and spoke at our second Fair Housing Friday. And they talked at great length about how the power dynamic between the landlord and the tenants made it really hard for them to speak up for themselves, and that people often didn't even know what their rights and responsibilities were. So of course we need to give, um, make sure our access um, to education is really um, accessible. And we know that if housing is not an option for everyone, that our tenants become, a, um, you know, they're in a precarious pla place where they're not, they don't have ownership over the place that they live. So we have to make sure that they have housing stability. And just cause is one way to do that. Um, and then here we go, the, um, John Hafner for Vital Communities joined us for a second Fair Housing Friday. And he talked, um, he did a really excellent presentation again about um, shifting this conversation, shifting the story about who we are. And he starts with this, um, it's a different picture than the first time I saw him give this presentation. He Googles Vermont like house or something. And he just shows this like picture, which is the icon that we all imagine home to be in Vermont, like the, the rolling hills and the single family home and the barn, right? Uh, most of us don't live in houses that look like this. It's not a um, sustainable practice. 
Um, and he kind of did this really excellent presentation about the housing as a theory of everything. And one of the examples that he gave was um, we often don't talk about mobile homes and or uh, modular home communities as a affordable housing option, but that's a really important part of our housing options in Vermont. And for a lot of folks who need affordable housing, it's actually, um, you know, perhaps more meets their needs better. Because um, uh, modular home communities or mobile home communities can be um, in more, often are in more rural places. So you get that connection to nature. Um, he talked about an example where um, one community had access to renewable um, energy resources technology, and it brought their bills down and made the living there even more affordable. And then, of course, um, some of these communities already have kind of a social component built into it. So um, this is just a really great framework to use when thinking and talking about housing. And again, it's recorded and on our website. Well, um, shortly will be on our website. I'm a little bit behind. So yeah, obviously it comes back to thinking about the spaces that people are living in. Um, I'm not going to touch on this, but I'm just going to say again, this um, CEDO gave a really great presentation about the, the different types of houses uh, that exist in Burlington. And um, one of the things he mentioned is that um, we, in Vermont, we often face this pushback where they say, hey, like affordable housing, it's not like more housing or higher density housing, denser housing isn't part of the character of the community. And over here, we're seeing um, there's like 10 units, 80 units, 15 units, 53 units, which I'm like, how is that even possible? So you can see that all of these um, um, homes look the same. So uh, that's debunked, character of community. Um, and I just want to end on um, the why our uh, story and housing um, you know, that what I've been talking about this whole time. So when we talk about home, we rarely have the opportunity to speak about it outside the brick and mortar of housing. And at a time when communities across the U.S. are facing their greatest need for housing, it's critical to be thinking as much about community connection and environmental resilience as the physicality of the development. Um, and not, um, I notice a pattern, I think we all notice a power, pattern in housing where we just use the same terminology over and over again. We often have the same speakers. Uh, we may use acronyms that are not accessible to people. Um, and these uh, phrases can already evoke binary and polarized assumptions. And we see that all the time when we talk about affordable housing. It's so easy for someone to desire housing for their family and friends when that need inevitably arises, because it always does. But it's, um, as soon as this term affordable housing is thrown into play, oftentimes um, that's when those, these ideas of what that means comes up. So, this is where I'm ending. Yeah, let's keep this conversation going. There's, the work is already happening and let's make sure that we just prioritize in this work that we're doing and that as community members who aren't housing advocates, we elbow some space for um, engagement. That's it. And I think that Sarah Russell is coming up. Um, Sarah Russell has not prepared a thesis for graduate school. <laughs> I just, I'm just letting you all know. Yeah, well, if you, if I, I should have yeah. mentioned the art. I didn't want to show thing. you up. Though. But I do want to just show before I give the mic to you, my housing shirt. <laughs> Wait, step out so people can see oh, this way. Oh, it's the podium? Is yeah, it's the podium's in the way. I especially, ta-da. All right, should I close this? Sure. All right, the yeah. mic is yours. Thank you. Yeah, I did not prepare a thesis um, around this, um, but I wanted to start off by saying thank you to um, CVOEO. Jess um, gave a lot of shout outs in the beginning, and I don't know if really did herself and her team justice with all of the hard work that they've done with putting together these events. I mean, this is like 
incredible work that they've done across the state um, for the entire month. I think you both need a huge vacation now because I don't know how you're, how you're doing all of this. So um, thank you so much for being so dedicated to this work and um, sharing so much of yourselves um, with all of us. Uh, so tonight I was asked to talk a little bit about um, homelessness and Corinne did a really fabulous job of talking about um, housing and all of the ways that housing can look different and feel different to people. Um, and um, I think that for some folks who are not in housing yet, they still have a sense of home, right? They still have a sense of community. And it's something that we try to build among people and it's something that we see people trying to build among themselves, whether that is within a shelter setting, whether that is outside, you know, unsheltered or camping, um, whether that is within the YMCA, um, that whether that is at the, um, the Elmwood Community Shelter that we recently, um, recently opened a few months ago. We see people trying really hard to make connections with people. And I think that that's really at the core of what Corinne's been talking about is like this connection that, um, that people desire, that everyone wants. And certainly that's more feasible within a home, um, you know, where, where you have a defined space that you can call your home or call your own. Um, but we still see people across the community working to build community in different ways, working to build that connection. Um, so a few of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight were um, in addition to working for the city of Burlington as the special assistant to end homelessness, um, I also um, serve as the co-chair for the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, uh, which if you're not familiar with the Homeless Alliance is a group of about 30, um, 30-ish uh, stakeholders um, in the community representing um, other community agencies, representing the city, um, and uh, representing members of um, you know, our state team, um, Agency of Human Services, et cetera, um, who work together to, um, in partnership um, to try to find a path forward to support people with moving into permanent affordable housing. Um, our, our mission is to be clear realistic and it is not to end homelessness. It is acknowledging that we will have some churn within our system at all times, but it's ensuring that homelessness is rare when it happens, that it's brief, that we're able to move people right back into permanent housing and avoid a long stint without housing, and um, that it's non-recurring, which is a key piece of this, and I do think speaks to a lot of what Corinne talked about around the importance of prevention work. So if we're not targeting that prevention work and or targeting our efforts toward that prevention work, at the same time as we're trying to trying to help people to um, to move into housing, then we're just gonna we're just gonna see this cycle, right? So we have to make sure that um, people have access to affordable housing um, in a way that is fair and equitable, um, but also that they keep and they maintain that housing. So those are sort of the key um, three key principles that we work um, that we work under um, with the Homeless Alliance. Um, one of the ways that we try to create equity in the system, I heard a lot about fair housing. Um, in, uh, in what Corinne was saying, and I think really at the core of that is equity, right? So making sure that people have equity and access to housing resources. And in our community and other communities across the country, we have something called um, coordinated entry, which um, means that it's a no wrong door approach, that no matter what social service organization that folks enter through for assistance, they will receive access to the same housing resources as anyone else. Um, we also measure, um, use collective data as a community so that we can measure our impact um, and understand trends and really see kind of like how we're doing and like where something works really well, like what did we do that worked so well and how do we do more of that? How do we do that again? Um, so some data points I wanted to share this evening <clears throat> are that in Chittenden County right now there's currently um, 626 households um, who are homeless within our system. Um, those are households, mind you. So a household could be one person or it could be five or six or seven people. Um, we have 64 families um, out of that um, 626. 
we have 231 chronic households, which is, um, which is a number that is higher than what we've ever seen. Pre-pandemic, that number was around 35. And the, the definition of chronic means that it's long-term homelessness, so, so, so that people have been in a state of homelessness um, for 12 consecutive months at minimum. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of people in homelessness for a much longer period of time, which really gets at that brief piece. We gotta figure that, we have to figure that piece out. Um, we also have 25 veterans um, who are currently homeless and we have 43 youth, which is really sad and super tough. So those youth are ages 18 to 24. Um, and you know, many of them, we know that when children experience homelessness in their families, that they are far more likely to experience homelessness as adults. So it's super critical that we tackle that youth number two. So we break out by each subpopulation to understand kind of how we're doing, you know, with, with certain subpopulations to make sure that we're, we're, we're assisting the most vulnerable people in our community. That's kind of the equity piece. Um, and I guess I want to say one last data point, I will say. So those, that, that feels crummy. That doesn't feel good <laughs> to hear that. Um, we have currently 90 households um, within our coordinated entry system that are ready to move into housing. They have done everything that they need to do to be successful in housing, and they're just waiting for an affordable unit. So to think about, that's a, that's a big chunk of the, you know, that 626 households, um, and it really speaks to the need for affordable housing and you know, for, to make sure that we're being able to, or we're, that we're able to transition people from homelessness into affordable housing in a way that is equitable. Um, I will say that the last data points are a little bit more upbeat. We're doing a great job at housing people, um, you know, as quickly as possible as units become available. We're, you know, forming partnerships with um, private uh, de housing developers for the very first time, thanks to some um, to, to um, some incentives around fun for them to access funding. Um, in December, we housed 52 households. Um, in January, we housed 26, February, we housed 27, and March, we housed 28. So we're really making a dent, we're trying to really make a dent in, um, in doing that. Um, the last piece that I wanted to speak to, I've talked to um, data a lot, and I think something that really shined through in what Curran um, was sharing with you all and something that I really want to share that I feel super passionately about is that connection piece. Um, I heard you say, and I had actually written it down on my, on my PowerPoint here, um, is listening to people. And I think that that's something that we, gets really like underrated, right? Like we don't, it, we think about like when you come home from work and somebody asks you about your day, you're not thinking like, gosh, somebody cared what I did all day long. You know, you're like, oh, I, you know, got into traffic and I couldn't get this at the grocery store and, you know, got to pick up the kids from whatever, you know, but for, for, for folks who don't necessarily have that connection, like that listening piece is so critical. And it's something that I try to focus on in like every single interaction that I have with people. And um, it can be overwhelming, but I think that we really don't give credit to that connection piece and to that listening piece. And I think that I would add to that is like listening and showing up. And when you say you're gonna show up, like be there and show up. And I think that it helps to build trust within a population that sometimes has had trust broken many, many, many times over and over and over again. And so to me, I think the most important thing that we can do is fill that connection gap, um, listen, and show up. So that's that's where I would where I would leave that. I think that um, we every single person that I've talked to, and I have been doing this work now for 20 years. Actually, um, I started off doing direct service, um, providing case management to households um, who were homeless uh, for a nonprofit here in Burlington, and then I moved into um, working for the Burlington Housing Authority and um, managing and developing um, housing retention programs um, to prevent people from becoming homeless. Um, 
and now I've moved to this position at the city where I'm able to kind of merge both of those things around both the homelessness piece and also um, working on that prevention piece. So it's been, a, it's been a, a really great trip for me personally, but I think that the most important thing that I've learned and the thing that I carry with me are these stories that I have talked to, you know, talked to hundreds of people over the last 20 years, um, and I, I carry those with me, you know, and that inspires me. It, makes me cry <laughs> because it's sad. It makes me smile because, you know, it feels good. Just this evening, um, I was walking in my car right before this, um, this meeting, and um, a gentleman and his partner were coming through the park, and he said, hey, Sarah, I just wanted to tell you, and he was a person that we had had at um, the extreme cold weather shelter that I staffed a few a few months ago, um, and he had a tough time at that shelter, but he came over to me and he's like, I just want to tell you, we just got into Elmwood. We have our own place there. Like, they're in a shelter unit, and, you know, he was just so excited, and the, the greatest thing that I heard them say was, like, we don't have to carry our stuff around everywhere. Like, we have a door that we can lock, you know, and I thought, like, how profound. I don't think about not being able to like run errands or drop my kids off somewhere or go to a doctor's appointment or go to work and think like, oh, I got to bring literally everything I own on my back, you know? And so they were just so excited. And I was like, God, like it made me just glow with um, just joy for them. So um, it's nice when, thing, when you get to see things come full circle. So I wanted to share that. Just happened tonight. Um, I think that's all I have to have to share. I don't know if I've gone over time or bored you all <laughs> or where we are in our program, but um, I guess I'll turn it back over to, to Jess. So thank you. Th thank you so much, Sarah and Corinne. And now that you've sat down, I'm going to ask you to come right back up um, because we want to open up to questions. We want to hear what you're all thinking, what, what inspired you from hearing those, these two talks? What are you thinking about? Has it changed your perception of home? What questions do you have for our amazing folks here? And we'll turn it over to both of you. Oh, we have a question from the audience. <laughs> That's an artist question. Should I go to the, the microphone? Yeah, okay, the answer is yes. Um, yeah, I think that that's a good question. So for anyone that didn't hear, um, uh, Lydia, who is clearly an artist wearing art pants with paint on them, has asked about vocabulary and words in housing and asked about abstraction. So I, I kind of went through those images really fast, but you might have seen some figures, you might have seen no figures, and that is because I do kind of play around with this idea of abstraction. And I think the thing that abstraction does in visual art is it makes something more nuanced, so it doesn't mean it's one thing, right? So there's, um, you know, like, everyone's probably done that thing where you're like lying on the bed and you're looking at like the shadows or the, or the drip marks on the ceiling and you kind of see a face and like for you it's always a face but for your sister it might be like, I don't know, a weird cloud shape or something kind of scary. So that's kind of what abstraction does. You can see what you're looking for and it can mean something very different for each person. Um, and I think that, that it's... I'm like, how do we do that in housing language? I'm not quite sure, but I, I think that some of the, the things I pointed to starts to do that. Any other questions? We have another question.
Yeah. Yeah, do you want to take a stab at that, Sarah? No, no. <laughs> 28 years of experience. No, no, I don't. Um, I mean, I think that what we saw, what I, what we saw with the pandemic is that we, um, there were, there used to be very, there or there are very strict definitions of homelessness. So, for example, within that definition, couch surfing does not count. So, if you have nowhere to go and are sleeping on the floor of someone else's home, then you, you don't, you, you're not homeless. If you're in a motel paying for yourself to stay in a motel, like you're working so hard and you are paying, you're paying so much for your motel that you can never get out of there. It's called self pay. That doesn't qualify as homeless. And so we miss a lot of people, you know, when we talk about people who are at risk, of homelessness, there are very clear definitions around people who are at risk. So that means that you have to be, you have to receive an eviction notice in order to be at risk of eviction. And for some of these challenges, like people need support long before they get that eviction notice, like to repair harm in some cases within 30 days or 14 days is like literally impossible. So I think that the definitions that we used pre-pandemic for homelessness were, super, were, were really tight. And what the pandemic did was allowed us to say, we don't, we're not gonna use those definitions, we're gonna help everybody who needs help and we're gonna give them a safe place to stay during this public health emergency. And so we moved a bunch of people who were in those like on the fringe, really vulnerable situations into motel rooms. What we didn't see during the pandemic was a lot of people lose their housing because of the eviction moratoriums. However, the minute that those were lifted after the pandemic, we saw people becoming, you know, falling into eviction. So I think we had a couple of things happening where we all of a sudden were getting a full scope view of the number of people who are homeless, really, and who really, you know, were living on the fringe or were housing insecure. And then we put them in motels and now we have no affordable housing to move those to move those folks into. Um, so it's, it's become a huge challenge for sure. I mean, I think that we, um, with the motel program, I think that's, everybody's hearing about that sort of in the news. Um, you know, the current budget that's been passed by the Senate is now in the House, um, will send 90% of the three, there, in Trenton County there's 340 families or households that are in motels, will send 90% of those families out of motels, no longer be eligible after, after July 1st. We don't have housing to support those to support those families. I think we all agree that motels are not an ideal place to house households. I go on a you know weekend with my three kids in a hotel room and I'm ready to pull my hair out <laughs> after after the first 24 hours. It's not a healthy place to call home for people. Um, but but we don't have other solutions until we have more affordable housing. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. Um, I, I hope I've, I've provided some level of insight. Sure. I, just for you, like, I, I thought you were like, like itching in. No, yeah, no, what do you want to say? Just thinking, trying to answer me well. Um, the other part of your question that I would like to answer too is you, you, you were uh, talking about how you know, the economy is so good. Well, it is really good for a certain percentage of the population. And the problem is that the systems that we've created to um, to support the most vulnerable in our communities, to keep our economies going, they're all designed to benefit a very small amount of people who are already doing okay. Um, and those people are still doing okay, and they will always be doing okay. Um, and you know, what we saw during the pandemic is that the systems that weren't working still aren't working, and the challenges have really been exacerbated for the folks who are already feeling the pinch. Um, and so that's an, another reason as well. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we could answer that question for the rest of the evening, because that's what we do for work. But there, it's a complex um, problem, and it's a really good question. And, and if I could add just one more thing, if you want to, if you want to kind of think about this a little more, one of the books, there are a bunch of books down down the back that everyone's welcome to bring home, is a new book by Michael Desmond. Uh, he wrote um, Evicted, and his new book is called Poverty 
comma, by America. Um, and he talks about some of how we got where we are today, but also what could possibly be changed to make it better. So I'd encourage you to bring it home and give it a read. I haven't read it yet, it just came out, but I'm really looking forward to it myself. Well, I think we know. It just gets worse. <laughs> Unless we do something about it, which, um, you know, obviously the work that the housing advocates are doing is asking for more affordable housing. The problem is that uh, we ask for that all the time and we're not getting it very fast. It is slow moving. So, like, there's a whole nother conversation about how to circumvent, like, the, the bureaucracy of getting a housing. And part of, there's like a whole, because there's also the, like, the NIMBY attitude. So, you know, again, like, people want affordable housing until it's in their neighborhood. And it's like, across the board, it happens over and over and over again. It's usually the most liberal leading spaces that are actually the most um, against housing being developed in their communities. And there's always this idea of like, oh, that would be great over there, you know? Like, oh, the bus line's over there. You know, like, oh, but we're protecting nature over here. It's like we can do all the things, but like housing is a, a really important thing that also for th resilient communities in terms of environments too. But again, could talk about that all night long. But I saw a question. Who's like itching to start that? Should I start? You guys can think. Uh, audience. Oh, okay. So the question was, um, I'm paraphrasing. With all of the folks in the room that are like thinking and talking about housing all the time. Uh, if there was like a magic solution, like something that would just be, um, you know, foundational in changing this really long housing crisis, and I know you know this, Ted, we've been talking about the housing shortage in Burlington for at least a decade, many decades, you, a long time. And so like what, like, is there a thing that could really like move the lever that we're just like, you know, if, if we had a magic wand and, instead of saying like, oh, we can't even talk about that because it'd be too hard. And, and one of the things Bren brought up was affordable, and af affordable home ownership. A lot of the times they're not building equity as someone would of buying a house outright with, you know, inherited money or the money they got from their family selling their house.
Yeah, I think from the, oh, wait, did we hear, Megan. Oh, Brian. <laughs> Sorry, Megan. Oh, thanks, Megan. Brian, did you have something you wanted to add, or were you? Yeah. The, the only other thing that I would add is I think that in an ideal world, we would be challenging our own biases. So when we talk about building housing for folks, I think that people are often like, well, you know, as long as they're, you know, getting sober or as long as they have a job or, you know, as long as they, you know, are, you know, what, whatever that list goes on and on and on. And I think that what, you know, I've heard a few times tonight around housing as a human right is like, I think that what we actually have to do is like embrace that thought, right, that housing is a human right, and it's not but for, you know, different different populations or people who have challenges. We have to actually, like, own that as a value, as a society, and, I mean, if there is a, a <laughs> something we could, a magic, you know, wand that I could do, it would be to, you know, really consider what it would, what it would look like for housing to be for everyone, you know, regardless of, you know, how they grew up, what they look like, how they, you know, interact with others, if they're using substances, you know, what color their skin is, how many people they have in their family, you know, whatever that might look like. I think that, like, we need to, we need to really just, like, put that on, like, a blanket in society. Yeah, and um, I think it's probably just around, okay, I've got like two minutes. So I'll just say too, in the spirit of Fair Housing Month, I, for me, one of the big issues is that people actually don't live outside of their uh, socioeconomic bubble. Like a lot of their friends are in the same bubble, uh, this, have a lot of the same upbringings, a lot of the same backgrounds and beliefs. And if you don't experience something that's outside of what you grew up with, like it's so much easier to other it. 
And like, there's certain things that you just don't know, you don't know. And one of the things I think about is, um, you know, the ways we communicate, like where, where I grew up and how I grew up, like yelling was a thing. It's not fun. Like, I don't love yelling, but like, it just was so much more a part of like our vocabulary, how we like work together, how we live together. And, uh, you know, like to this day, I often have uh, phone calls with uh, folks that I'm working with, and they might start that phone call yelling, and they might yell for like five minutes. And then afterwards, if I just like hold on and listen, them, they might be like, wow, so sorry that happened. I'm just so worked up about my home where I live and don't have decision-making power. It's like, yeah, of course, that's how trauma works. Like, you have an emotional reaction. But um, I, I have heard from folks that have been really vocally like, how is it a human right? Like, justice for all. And then they're like, but my neighbors are trash. You know, they, they're like, oh, I hear them yelling all the time. And it's like, but are they ye like are they yelling or are they like having a real good party over there? You know, like what's is their dog just really bothering them? And that's how they communicate. We just there's so much we don't know, and and because we live in these communities, like like South Burlington just passed um, you know policy last year that kind of further soci like divided the city based on socioeconomic background. And you know there's this conversation about like oh. Oh, well, if affordable housing is going to exist, it might as well exist near the bus line. It's like, not you can't assume what people need. Like, if people have a like have a car and want to drive to their affordably priced home and want to live close to the woods too, like that really should be an option. Um, yeah, so I think that until we have more integrated communities, and that's where it comes back to spaces, spaces where people interact, and we don't all have the same background, we don't have the same assumptions, like then we can start to actually get, um, you know, muscle behind these ideas. Because uh, I can tell you, I, I'm obviously like on a younger end of the affordable housing advocates, like rapidly not be, being that anymore as I age out of that. But um, from the time I've done this work, it's been a lot of the same people. Like I've, I, every time I meet a young affordable housing advocate, I'm like, oh, how did I not know you're out there? Cause it's, it's really, it's been the same people for a long time. And that's kind of on us because of the vocabulary thing. So, you know, it's, there's no magic wand, I think, is the thing that it really comes down to, but hopefully more of this. I don't know if I could say that. Is that it? Do we do a formal closeout? Yes. So the I am going to trip and fall on that I'm before, so before the night is over. Um, thank you, Corinne. Thank you, Sarah. Thank all of you for coming here tonight and being part of this conversation because as, as we learned, the conversation is what's important. Talking about these issues and talking about these issues with someone who you don't talk to every day is even more important. So as you go out there in the world, think about what we've talked about today. Talk with a neighbor, talk with a friend, talk to a random person on the street and you know, get to know who's in our community and through that, that make, it makes such a difference. Um, there are lots of other ways to get involved with this work, both throughout the uh, Fair Housing Month is officially over at the end of April, but the work continues year round. And every day is Fair Housing Day. Um, there's an event this Saturday, which, will, uh, which is at Main Street Landing. It's a free movie night with the Pursuit of Happiness, um, um, starring Will Smith, and I think it's his son's um, movie debut. It was a movie from the early 90s, maybe. Um, talks about a salesman who um, ends up um, experiencing homelessness with his son after an eviction. Uh, and there'll be a happy hour with more discussion, with food, and more free books from CETO. Um, and then the free movie, and it's at 6 o'clock this Saturday, the 29th at Main Street Landing. You're all invited. Bring a friend. Um, and then if you go to our website, the Fair Housing Month website, which is fairhousingvt.org. Fair Housing Month VT. Thank you, Corinne. Fairhousingmonthvt.org. Um, you'll see the calendar of events, which includes um, more activities over the next few weeks and recordings of the Fair Housing Fridays that Corinne talked about. So thank you for coming out today. Keep this conversation going. 
put pressure on your local, state, federal governments to make changes, to make the changes that we want to see. Um, and last but not least, before you leave this room, and you're welcome to stay for as long as you want and continue talking, have more food, check out the books in back, take some home. There are art kits, take as many as you'd like for your family and friends. Um, and then we also have fair housing materials and resources from CVOEO on the table, and also some posters for the movie night, which is coming up. So take one with you, put it up at your work and your corner store, and help us spread the word. Thank you all to everyone who helped make this happen, and good night. <laughs>